Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Kelly, uh, CEO of the Kai Association. And we've been around now 20 years trying to bring greater professionalism and transparency beyond the 60-40 model. And the panel here today is going to be talking about product innovation in uh, asset management. And if we look at the starting point of the 60-40, which used to be the old uh, approach to diversification, uh, year to date, that 60-40 model is down almost 18%. And you're the S&P that's in pretty much in uh, bear territory, down 20. The uh, Lehman, or I guess now no longer Lehman, the aggregate index is down almost 12. So, so diversification has come back uh, to bite perhaps a little bit if those are your only two asset classes. But like a broken clock, uh, it's occasionally right. Uh, so I don't think uh, we should be dismissing these asset classes, but maybe there's life beyond just the 60-40 model. But I will say that this is the worst start to the 60-40 since 1976, so a little bit of a unprecedented territory for us, but we've always espoused the virtues of greater diversification beyond those two asset classes. So we're going to delve into this a little bit, but maybe we'll just start with very quick uh, panel uh, introductions. Yes, hi, I'm uh, Sean Groves. I work at Masterworks MWC Group. Uh, we are the distribution arm working within Masterworks that provides access uh, to physical fine art. We are the first firm to provide securitized ac access to this asset class. That's roughly $2 trillion in size. Uh, and as we are talking with our clients that are concerned about some of the considerations uh, that were reflected as far as the 60-40 portfolio, you know, there are the alternative asset classes uh, such as private equity, private credit, real estate, and the like that have been around for decades that have been accessible. Uh, and then there are new uh, asset classes that have emerged over the last few years or maybe decade in the cryptocurrency or other digital asset space. And then there's another that's been around for centuries. And uh, as we look at that, that helps inform where we think there could be value for investors and you know, look forward to sharing our thoughts along those lines. Thanks, Kelly. Hey, everyone. My name is Kelly Yi. I lead research at Coindesk Indices, which is an index provider in the crypto world. So our goal is to really provide transparency and science into crypto investing. We have the longest-running real-time Bitcoin in the index, which is powering one of the largest crypto funds in the world. We also have a suite of single-asset and multi-asset indices that are licensed by asset managers, exchanges, market makers to provide their client access to crypto. So thinking about asset allocation, what we have done is we created this digital asset classification framework, which is really used to provide a roadmap for investors to navigate different type of cryptocurrency based on their use case. Uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Jordan? I am Jordan Howard. Is this on? Okay, good. Um, uh, I run uh, Amass Insights, uh, and we have been working in uh, the alternative data space for about a decade now. Um, and our main goal is to organize the world's data and make it easily findable. Uh, what that means in practice is we work with a lot of hedge funds and other asset managers to uh, enhance their alternative data strategy, uh, allow them to more efficiently bring on board alternative data and discover exactly the right alternative data that works within their investment processes and um, to answer some of their investment theses. Um, and I also actually have a side gig now in, in crypto, which uh, started in, in March 2021, uh, called Big Data Protocol. The token is actually uh, traded on uh, mostly decentralized exchanges um, called BDP. Uh, and what we do, it's really a Web3 version of Amass Insights in a way, but it's actually a functional data marketplace um, in which we tokenize these alternative data sets um, and allow people to uh, sell, buy, and even stake on these data sets. And um, in some ways, we're actually uh, creating a new asset class, which is uh, within crypto as data as an asset class, uh, which really should be shown on a balance sheet of some of these companies, especially the more data-driven companies or, or even companies that haven't yet monetized their data. They, they really should be showing data in their balance sheet as an asset. Thanks, Greg. I'm, uh I'm Greg Deeds. I, I work for the Southern Ute Indian Tribe Permanent Fund, which is charged with funding the tribal government in perpetuity. Uh, we started a while back with a 60-40 portfolio, and over the last half dozen years have been transitioning to try and add uh, different asset classes that are going to be less correlated. Uh, the more things get traded, in my experience, the more correlated they tend to become. Um, and, uh, and so we're continuing to look for new areas uh, that we think will be less correlated to to the broader uh, broader equity and, and fixed income markets, 
income, fixed income obviously has historically been negatively correlated, but bond math is bond math, so that being what it is, we're, we've been looking for, uh, for other areas. Thanks, Greg. So uh, maybe we'll start with you because you're the resident allocator in this panel, and I must say you made the panel pretty nervous coming in uh, stage left, but you're here, so thank you for showing up. Uh, so we've got, uh, broadly speaking, art coins and all data, but uh, from the allocator standpoint, uh, we talked about the endowment model. It's now 55 years old, uh, so a little bit long in the tooth, perhaps. But but the genesis of that was to be able to go uh, long on the liability side, uh, of, of match your assets to the liability side of the balance sheet, collect your liquidity premium, collect a complexity premium, and we know how the story goes. So, so how are we doing with the endowment model? Is it still alive and well before we talk about some of these newer uh, options? I I think it's still alive and, and well. I, I still think that there's an illiquidity premium. Uh, I, some of it is a little bit faked because um, it doesn't get marked to market. So you get to sort of ignore the, the pain that you would have taken along the way. But I do think that there is still a liquidity preference. Um, I think the ability to, uh, to invest for the long term and look at what your long term liabilities are going to be and try and match those, I still think provides, um, yeah, provides some in some informational and investment uh, advantages. So uh, being able to spend your time looking in areas where others aren't, uh, which is something that the endowment model, I think, provides, uh, is, 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 is still a, an advantage for, for us and for other firms that are or groups that are doing the same thing. And I think if we stay with this team, and I, I want to bring Kelly in here in a second, uh, the endowment model was early to VC, early to private equity, yep. early to commodities. But uh, uh, are you investing in any type, type of coin or virtual currency right now? We've got just a tiny bit of exposure to some of our, uh, through some of our growth and VC managers have exposure to it. We don't have it directly. I have a trading background, so I like inefficient markets with a lot of volatility because that's when it's easier to make money. So it's an area that we've been spending some time looking at. Uh, that said, I don't think we have a whole lot of interest in attempting to wager, you know, on whether a stable coin is going to, to win or lose. So we've looked at things like a Bitcoin mining firm that's profitable up until so long as Bitcoin is above 10 grand, um, which didn't seem that you know, risky a little while ago. Uh, now it seems a little, a little higher risk. Um, so, yeah, so we don't, have, we don't have a whole lot of direct, but it's an area that we've certainly been doing research on. Port, sort of in our, I think we're putting it in two buckets. One is sort of a trading strategy, um, believing that there's some arbitrage opportunities, and the other would be in sort of a VC type bucket. Uh, so, Kelly, maybe uh, 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 coming off some of uh, Gray's comments about where we are with virtual currencies and coins and adoption, probably not so much, maybe it's, it's coming on the institutional side more in the wealth management space, and, and it's interesting to hear Greg point, Greg's points about the infrastructure side of it as opposed to coin itself, so maybe some of your thoughts. Yeah, sure. So before I answer the question, I'd like to talk about a personal story here. I came from the ETF world where my firm, Index IQ, my old firm, Index IQ, was doing democracy democratizing alternative investment, we actually did extensive study on how you can replicate hedge funds, which is relatively easier than replicating um, uh, private equity and venture capital, where there are research showing that there are mar market factors driving the performance of those two. But obviously, there are illiquidity premium, but there are also sort of you are uh, marking it in a less frequent basis, that doesn't mean the risk is not there. So that's actually what's driving me into crypto, which is a liquid version of accessing some of the alternative investment themes there. So build to your question on where we are in the cryptocurrency world. So we call it digital asset. So they are not all, uh, not all, every digital asset is a currency, first of all. And when we think about the landscape, we really think about the digital, the whole digital economy and Bitcoin, for example, is more like a currency versus Ethereum, which is smart contract platform. So I think the first step investors take, and we talk to a lot of them there, is not necessarily asking, oh, should I allocate to crypto? But what should I allocate to, right? Uh, we have developed a digital asset classification system, which is a three-tiered hierarchy, just like how equities you're doing gigs, right? The sectors, you have energy, financials, and utilities. In crypto, we have different type of sectors and industry group as a first step. 
And when we think about cryptocurrency investing, the first thing, I, uh, it, it's still early stage, right? The, the adoption, as you see, the market has a lot of volatilities right now. But I think the first step people ask is even transparency. How do I benchmark my performance too, right? Some people just do Bitcoin. And the simple question on what does Bitcoin price trade at that is actually not so straightforward if you come from a TradFi world. Nobody is asking what IBM stocks price is. But, but when it comes to Bitcoin, depending on which exchange you're trading at, depending on the volume, it can be quite different. So we as index providers really trying to source data from eligible places and aggregate them in a way so that we can give investors a more objective answer of what the pricing data, what is the price for different type of digital assets. So Kelly, are these uh, indices for benchmark purposes or are they investable or both? Uh, for both right now, actually, if you think about us, it's almost like think about sort of TradFi equities world have different indices. Our clients are asset managers. I mean, for example, Grayscale is one of our biggest clients, and they use our indices both on the single asset side and multi-asset side. But there are also exchanges and market makers and service providers who are coming to us for reliable sources of pricing data. And, and maybe just the last follow-up, uh, do you have indices that are tied to some of the points Greg mentioned around infrastructure, if you want to get in that way, as opposed to just pure access to the coins? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very interesting uh, question. Actually, a lot of our clients who are more on the more conservative side, so I don't know which use case is going to uh, be promising, right? But we know that the infrastructure driving those use cases might be useful. So smart contract platform, for example, is a sector where you know Ethereum, which is really providing the infrastructure layer where you can use your blockchain to build decentralized applications. So if you don't know which DApp is going to work, at least you can invest in Ethereum and some of the alternative layer ones. Another sector that we consider interesting that touches on the infrastructure aspect is we call computing sector. For example, file Coin is a digital asset which is really provide us infrastructure for people to share storage. Uh, we know, I know we have a cloud expert before, right? So there are this type of applications which are more foundational in terms of building the digital economy. And on top of that, there are different use cases. Thanks, Kelly. So, uh, Sean, the alternative alternatives. So I guess art would clearly fall into that category. I'll check with Greg in a second if he owns it. But if you think about uh, maybe back to the endowment model, endowments are constantly getting donations in cryptocurrencies, in art, in every other form of asset. And then the university model has got to figure out that they want to hold it, sell it, uh, add to it, et cetera. But, uh, but maybe talk about, uh, first off, uh, is this a diversification play? What's the correlation to other asset classes and how would it fit into a portfolio, this being art? Yeah, so um, there's historical data going back on art uh, centuries. And as you think about price discovery, uh, that's actually been an area in thinking about, again, north, approximately a $2 trillion asset class where there hasn't been uh, much data in research. So as we think about uh, the art market in general, there's really just not been any price data that's been publicly or privately available that encompasses that art market. Uh, the differentiator in thinking about Masterworks in our approach is to actually do that work and do that type of research. It may seem in, in this type of room uh, pretty academic that you want prices in order to actually calculate an index or a benchmark and the like. And that information wasn't generally available until we hired 30 people and went through 3,500 paper catalogs page by page and recording that data. And that helped inform decades of data that actually informs basic elements of capital appreciation. So if you think about the, the components and the difficulties and the complexities that are generally available in public and private markets, um, that has just not generally been available within this $2 trillion asset class. So that helps inform the decision making and makes the art of investing less of what it had been solely in art for 275 plus years since Sotheby's was the first IPO and into more of a science. And so within that, that actually informs a quantitative approach as we think about it. So art in general, just for way of reflection, there may not be some insight generally within the room, but has appreciated uh, in the contemporary space by the mid-teens for the last few decades on par with private equity, although less levered, uh, actually not levered at all. And also thinking about correlation, it's one of the most uniquely uncorrelated asset class. So as we think about the endowment model and the considerations of adding any one line item to that endowment model and adjusting the other line items accordingly, the considerations of uh, low correlation kind of play out. And it's not just correlation in normal markets, but also as we've seen in volatile markets, how does that play out? 
um, we, over multiple periods of high volatility in the market, art has actually been even more negatively correlated with what we've seen generally within the market. So we think that's interesting. One data point is just looking at the last couple months, so as you were referencing, the market's being down 18%, and uh, we're setting records across the art market and check to have uh, pretty sizable gains. The key considerations on the endowment model that we think are interesting is they change by investor. Your $100 billion uh, client uh, can utilize uh, the endowment model. The billion dollar client perhaps considering you know, some objectives unique to them and your million dollar client has completely different objectives. You know, I came from the allocator perspective, wealth management side, and we took that endowment model because our advisors wanted it and we said, okay, you can use those asset classes but take those numbers and invert them so if venture capital isn't your, your highest line item, uh, you want to think about your liquid assets facilitating it. But the key consideration that we also looked at is who are the investors? It's not only um, who is actually investing today, but how has migrated and changed over time, which may help inform liquidity changes within that market. And not only the implicit le leverage of the asset class, but also the leverage of the individuals that are investing in it and how that can change during periods of volatility, which I, I'm not sure whether or not there's perfect data that helps inform as we go through periods of high volatility, how the investors would change and that velocity of their investment would change given those, it, those considerations. So those are things that we're trying to get additional insight into from the alternative data side that help inform the investor base that we're looking at, which is really the broad spectrum that hasn't been available. It's really only been the ultra wealthy, those with uh, tens and more uh, billions of assets that have been able to invest in this space. And how do we think this uh, to be an egalitarian uh, democratization approach for everyone to invest in, in this asset class. Uh, so, Sean, if a recession, I think, is it's inevitable, and yeah. how deep, how severe, how long, I guess, it may be more difficult to answer, but if I think about a non-essential item like art uh, likely to get hit from a pricing standpoint in the short term, a full stop, you can comment on that, but what type of holding period should you be thinking about if you're investing in an asset class like art? Yeah, so it's a fair consideration. Generally, again, over the last few decades, the, only those that have been able to invest in art have been those that uh, had tens of billions in assets. The best risk-adjusted returns within the art space are, uh, is artworks that are between 1 and 30 million in size, post-war contemporary in, in consideration of the uh, magnitude. And so in order to have an appropriate asset allocation, you would have needed to have uh, several hundred million, if not a billion plus, to appropriately allocate into that. In general, the ultra wealthy have been less levered uh, by and large. So as we think about the art market, it's generally been a call option on the ultra wealthy. And because of that, they aren't facing margin calls or they have broad diversification and it d isn't necessarily the first asset that they sell. Also because of the personal aspect, you know, the consideration is that physical object that uh, people are less li likely to sell, similar to real estate, although slightly different. Um, so as we think it, you know, as we look at recessions, you know, that we haven't necessarily, or art hasn't necessarily exhibited, you know, substantial drawdowns in the same way that we've seen with other asset classes. Plus it's unlevered and that, that helps. Uh, the consideration around liquidity premiums, and as you're looking at asset allocation models, and any time you have an asset class that has a very low correlation, you, you know, consider adding incremental amounts in that asset class, and you could see a substantially high allocation to any one of those assets. Our considerations and constraints on that are the liquidity premium, and there's been a number of studies looking at not only the liquidity premium of the asset itself, but also the securities that are invested in that and how that helps inform maximum uh, allocations there. So we've generally done our own internal studies, capping it out at 5%. We've worked with third-party providers, Credit Suisse, City, independently, that came at allocation levels between that 4 to 5% range. And that, I think, in general, as you think about the client and also looking at portfolio construction models, can help provide a consideration of that liquidity premium because the holding periods can be, you know, between 3, 7, 10 years. Thanks, Sean. So, uh, Jordan, thanks for your patience. So, underlying uh, anything we've talked about thus far is this new phenomenon, maybe not so new, of all data, and that provides greater analytical firepower around making decisions and more informed decisions. Uh, it perhaps is still somewhat nascent to some degree, but the size of the alt data market is enormous. So maybe you could just give us some of the size of conventions and talk about where we are in using alt data to make investment decisions. Sure, yeah. So uh, just, just starting from the beginning, I mean, the alternative data market 
really started in earnest, in my opinion. Uh, and actually, you'll hear a speaker later on today, Tony Berkman, um, who probably would be considered the grandfather of alternative data um, with uh, credit card transactional data about, about 15 years ago or so, maybe a little bit more. Um, and uh, and, and that, that, that data has been proven to be extremely valuable. There's still innovations in that space, um, especially when it comes to uh, expanding beyond to uh, geographies in terms of like Europe and Asia. Um, there's still transactional data that's, that's brand new in that space, uh, but it's pretty, it's pretty uh, uh, well used in the um, US market at this point. Um, but there's just a, been an explosion over the past, you know, 10 or so, maybe even five or so years in the alternative data industry. Um, you know, the, the, the token was only really term, uh, coined about five or so years ago. Um, and so there's plenty of innovation going on. Um, and it's really being used in all different ways now. We, really what it started in was public equities um, and really retail stocks. You know, how do you get better information about retail stocks and be able to trade them pre-earnings, figure out how, many people, how much money people are spending, on, on uh, these products, but it, it's gone, it goes well beyond that, and now it's being used by you know, different asset managers, whether it's private equity, whether it's venture capital, whether it's uh, you know, crypto, whether it's even art. I mean, Masterworks itself, I didn't, I'm not super familiar with the art investing space, but you know, while researching this panel, uh, I realized that Masterworks itself is basically a data provider. They just don't provide it externally, and they're using it for their own alpha, um, which, really is, is, uh, is kind of amazing what they've done. And, and they've created their own alternative data. Um, and so, and same with, same with Coindesk. You know, they're, they're collecting information and, and categorizing uh, these tokens and cat categorizing, you know, creating a whole taxonomy for how you come up with uh, what, what's the difference between all these tokens. Um, and there's, honestly, there's a lot of different types of tokens itself. Like if you go really to the base layer, um, there's, there's uh, utility tokens, which is what BDP, my, my side venture is. Um, and there's, there's securities tokens. And you, you really should be considering those differently in terms of your, your uh, diver diversification. Um, and then I've only really recently been seeing you know, uh, allocators and, and uh, endowments you know, starting to think about their, their alternative data strategy. Um, and honestly, it, typically it has to do with, you know, uh, to the funds that they're, they're allocating their money to, what are, what are their alternative data strategies? Do they have one? And if they don't have one, should they? Does it make sense within their, in, within their investment process? Um, are they generating alpha? And if they're not, why? It might be because they're not using alternative data effectively enough. Um, and and uh, there actually are, in my opinion, alternative data sources when it comes to researching the underlying funds or hedge funds. Um, a company like EPFR, if you haven't heard of, they're, they're, they're uh, trying to figure out all the fund flows in the industry. Now, you can consider that alternative or traditional, but it's very valuable information. You know, it's, it's not only fund flows um, macroeconomically between countries, but it's also fund flows between the hedge funds themselves um, and allocators, as well as their performance. And a lot of that information is collected, you know, uh, public, you know, through public filings, but it's really actually hard to find. And some of the public filings in different countries are extremely hard to parse through. Um, and so uh, there's just a lot of different ways that you can gather information uh, for the asset management space, and no matter where you're sitting in that asset, asset management space. So um, I, I just think that's, that the allocators are going to be have, going to have to kind of do their due diligence on the funds themselves to, to figure out, are they being innovative? Uh, so, uh, Jordan, the best use case for this all data then, is it finding a better stock idea before my neighbor or maybe trying to figure out how I can use it to either de-risk an investment process or solve for ESG or maybe it's both? Yeah, I mean, you could, you, you really could do anything. Uh, you know, if you, I always tell my, my clients, like, if you can dream up, you know, a way that information is being created digitally, you can find a way to gather that information, you know, through a partnership or through through a company. So, if you know that, you know, for example, um, you know, a good example, how I started in, my, in this industry was, I knew that Netflix and Amazon were doing a lot of their business through email, um, sending by, you know, sending emails, receipts out to to customers, um, and so I said, hey, you know, what if you had a large sample of these people's emails? And you were able to gather how much, how much money people are spending. And it's not just through credit cards. It's through a completely different source. And it's actually much richer information. You see the products they're buying. Um, and so that's what we did about eight years ago. We were the first to ever start monetizing email transactional data on a, a sample of over about two or three million people. Um, and 
you know, it was a very successful, uh, you know, data monetization exercise that can be done within a lot of different in, uh, companies, um, you know, whether they're tech companies, fintech companies, if they are collecting information for their own purposes and it's, and it's at, you know, a big enough sample size, um, it likely can be used for other purposes that they may not have thought about at first. And so we do a lot of educating our, our hedge fund clients on, you know, how to, how, you know, to look at alternative data and, you know, what to put, what value to put on it and where to find it. So, Greg, a couple follow-ups, and I'll come to you, Kelly. I saw the, the move. So, uh, do you own Artwork, or have you ever looked at it as an asset class? We've, we've done uh, just a, a call with Masterworks, but we don't uh, any, own any Artwork, uh, yeah, directly. Okay. And then uh, a data scientist on the payroll of the Indian tribe? We, no, we do not have it. We have some operational people, and we use some third-party resources, but we don't have a data scientist on board. And I then uh, and maybe the last related to that, perhaps, is that if you think about some of the hedge fund strategies or hedging strategies, or maybe even some of your, your private capital managers, are they utilizing all data? Is that part of the investment process? They, they definitely are, because some of them have, ta have talked about things like you know, the, some of the credit card data or you know some of the earlier alt data st uh, stuff where they were talking about taking, you know, pictures of parking lots and all those sorts of things. Um, but frankly, one of the things that, um, you know, that this panel uh, prompted with, with me in discussing with Jordan some of the things that they've done is, like, all right, we need to understand better, you know, how our managers are using this data and using that as a way to differentiate, hopefully, on, on a go-forward basis, winners from losers, especially, I would say, more in the, in the private uh, private equity and perhaps VC space as opposed to, I think the, the more trading focused hedge fund people have been, a, I think, a bit more on the, on the leading edge of this. So I, I want to come back to due diligence, but Kelly, you had a point. Oh, I was just thinking about alternative data because I was a quant by training and I was when, at that one time client of, you know, Jordan's type of firms. So one thing I think alternative data, getting data is not easy, but the harder part is asking the right question. So Jordan, when you mentioned like how can the satellite data or the email data be useful, right? In crypto world, you would imagine everything is on chain, so it's public, right? And it's technically not that hard, I would say, to run a node and get all the on-chain data. But translating that data into insights and alpha is an extremely hard job. For example, factor investing concept is very popular in equities, and I was able to expand it to fixed income in my previous job. In crypto, is there such concept at mo as momentum, volatility, and valuation? And if so, what type of data do you, la do you look at to really derive that insights is something my research team is actively looking at. So I would say without like all the details and nuances, how do you translate the data? Or how do you even ask a question on what type of data would be useful is actually the bigger question and challenge. So maybe then as a follow-up to Jordan, if I think about the very best data, it's something of value not in the public domain, which sounds like the definition of insider trading. So, uh, so maybe you could talk about uh, getting access to this data and some of the regulatory issues because the regulation has not kept pace with this data. Actually, I, I, I would uh, argue against the, that it's not in the public domain. Um, that's just, uh, the public domain data actually can be alternative as well. And in fact, I actually think that's a really untapped resource. Um, obviously, SEC filings, they're you know, being combed through in, in much depth, but there's all sorts of other government filings that nobody probably has ever heard of here. Um, and an example of that is, you know, in order to drill for oil, you, you have to go through all these public filings that nobody ever looks at, and nobody really uses AI or, or NLP, or at least not many people use to, to comb through. And, you know, if you were to look that, through that information, you'd find a lot of investment opportunities within, in this case, the oil industry. Um, but in terms of the compliance processes, so it, obviously there are a lot of private data sets, you know, data sets that are coming from uh, fintech firms. Uh, you know, example of, of that being Yodli. Uh, that's where a lot of the credit card transaction data has come, or at least some of it has come from in the past. Um, and th there are a lot of compliance hurdles and procedures that both the data provider and the you know, data consumer, typically the hedge fund in this case, um, need to go through to, to make sure that they're not putting themselves at any unnecessary risk. Um, so uh, recently, about three or four months ago, um, the SEC uh, put out an alert uh, to you know, the, the constituencies and, um, and said, hey, 
you know, we, we've noticed a lot of uh, firms not going through the, the, the you know, necessary compliance processes when it comes to alternative data. They should be, they should be asking uh, data provider all sorts of questions about where the data has come from, what the the founder's background is, um, uh, you know, who this, uh, what are the sources of the data, data, you know, what are the agreements that the data provider has with those sources, and does it allow them to do what they want to do with it? How are they, you know, transforming that data, and is it being aggregated and anonymized in a, a good enough fashion? Um, and an example of uh, you know, about a few months, and the reason they came out with this was because a few months beforehand, they finally came down with a, you know, major action in terms of alternative data, and weirdly enough, it was actually not to a fund, it was to a company that was at the time called App Annie. I think they changed their name now, uh, rebranded to data.ai, um, but they were, uh, just to make it very simple, they were kind of lying about how they were generating and collecting their data, um, and it, it's more complicated than that, but basically they weren't adequately anonymizing the information that they were getting. Um, and so uh, there was a, a, a big fine and the CEO uh, had to, you know, leave the company and no, couldn't, couldn't uh, manage any, any data provider uh, for the next several years. Um, but that really put the data providers on notice. Obviously, a hedge, uh, the hedge funds, from my experience, because um, I work a little more, more larger hedge funds or larger funds in general, they have already been aware that this was coming for many years. And so they put a lot of good compliance processes in place. Um, but it does take a lot of resources. And as, a, as an allocator, um, I would start you know, not only asking them questions about what type of alternative data they're using and, and how they're generating alpha, but what are, what are their processes? What, you know, are they um, going through a step-by-step -step process to make sure that when they're onboarding a data provider that it's not you know, violating any policies? Um, and, and also, it's, this is an important aspect that is actually probably the harder thing to do, which is ongoing monitoring of those data providers. Because they may change who their sources are, they may change their the way that they do ETL and and uh, how they analyze their data, um, and you need to make be aware of that. They might get acquired by somebody. You need to be aware of that. Um, and that was also in this fraud this uh, alert from the SEC was you need to continually monitor. Um, and so if you're doing uh, you know if you're trying to do risk uh, analysis on the constituencies within your your fund, you really need to be asking you know, at least some questions about, you know, what, what uh, documents are my, my funds collecting about these providers? Uh, so, Greg, maybe uh, bringing this back to a due diligence question then, there was a firm that's been in the news, uh, not recently, but the last couple of years, called Clearview AI. And if any of you have a Facebook or Instagram or a LinkedIn profile, 100% certainty that your image has been scraped and is being held by them. And when we had the January 6 riots, uh, the federal government went to Clearview AI and identified a lot of these folks through the, the images they capture because most of us don't have arrest records. So if you haven't had a mugshot, there's other ways of getting it. So we don't have a national definition of privacy. GDPR exists uh, overseas. But as you think about the use of this alt data and talking to your managers, have some of your questions around due diligence uh, evolved to bring in maybe questions about whether or not they're using this data correctly? Uh, I think one nice thing about the asset management industry, the hedge fund industry, in terms of alternative data is um, they don't mostly care about who the people are. Like, they, it really does not matter that much your name and that you're, you know, 25 years old and that you're, uh, you know, you like playing video games. Um, that doesn't matter. It's really about the in the aggregate because uh, at least historically, it's mostly been about trading public equities, which are very large usually and, and, and have, a, uh, you know, a high amount of revenues and one person or a few people or even a category of type of people are not going to move the needle a hell of a lot. It's really about the aggregate of revenues for that organization. But it, it will start to become a question more and more um, when you're talking about uh, VZ, VC or private equity investing, where it's smaller companies, there's, a, there's more of a thin file of information on them. They might not report anything publicly. And you might want to know that, for example, uh, somebody is buying uh, you know, a $10 million piece of artwork, and that's going to move the needle on that particular private company. Um, so th that is something that we hopefully will, uh, you know, the U.S. regulatory 
uh, system will you know transition us into a more uh, a space where we can actually understand what they want us to do what they don't want us to do but right now you just have you as a fund you just have to stay super safe because you just have to assume the worst so uh, Greg a consideration from the allocator standpoint well, well from our we're not sort of in the in the sort of looking at this from a larger global what privacy standards people should be held to and what the where the regulations should go it's it's much more from a standpoint of our managers going to get in trouble uh, you know cost us money potentially bring embarrassment to the tribe that's that's where our focus would be um, and and I guess it's in, in, in our experience what we've been spending more to, I mean, more time and is is generally been in the in the public space because um, to, to his point on a lot of the data being sort of anonymized, you know, when you're looking at RMBS and those things, you don't care about any specific uh, borrower, uh, but it's more reputational risk. Uh, and so for us, we've spent more time dealing with that on the public side. Uh, it's, it's frankly an area where we're going to probably spend some more time on the private side I as well. Okay, thanks, Greg. So, Sean, uh, maybe uh, taking some of these themes back to, uh, to art, where virtually any asset can be tokenized. And we've talked a little bit about the, the Beeple phenomena, the $69 million uh, art sale at Sotheby's. Are you dealing in NFTs or tokenized real estate, uh, tokenized artwork at all? Uh, yeah, to answer your question, no, we are not involved with the NFT space. And I can cover that in a minute. But just a continuation of the, the conversation there. I've, I've had prior lives working in uh, PM roles at hedge funds and private equity. And one of our major challenges was we did have great external resources and sourcing data, uh, and also third party. But our key considerations are, how do you actually translate that value for alpha generation for others to perceive? And that was a constant challenge despite creating the infrastructure to facilitate it. And then from an allocator's perspective, uh, from our, our side, of just how pervasive was that alpha generation framework that you were using that all data? Is it a small, minute, f finite time that you're able to source that and other competitors come in or that um, gap actually closes to where you're not able to generate additional alpha. Just for perspective, and I think it relates to the NFT question, our focus has really been on simplicity and transparency in that you know we buy artwork that's been around for decades, uh, structured in LC, facilitate a public offering. You have a 110-page offering, Reg A+, plus, similar to an S1 or IPO, and it's everything that you would need or want to know qualitatively or quantitatively about that artwork. In a lot of cases, it's consolidating information that's either broadly publicly available, or, and there may be sm small snippets that's not private, but effectively democratizing not only the asset, but also the knowledge base for everyone to know and understand what's being invested in, which I think that level of transparency is just not generally available in other asset classes, and a struggle that I had from an allocator's perspective of determining what it is that I was buying, what are the fees, how is it managed. In, in that case, I think the simplicity and transparency is there. As it relates to NFTs, we know and understand there's a market for it. It's relatively new, a few years, so it's we can't, and we've done a lot of work on this, how do we actually construct an index around it that makes sense for allocating assets and come up with guidance for advisors and clients of how much to allocate to? Uh, plus, it's, you know, admittedly a lot of uh, volatility associated with that. So, you know, as we think about where the market would be going, it's a little tough for us to get there. There are complexities with art that make authenticity and registration uh, of the artists and the artworks uh, a legal regulatory issue, and I know other providers are using blockchain methods in order to do that. We'll see how that progresses, but I think there are major concerns from the regulatory side there. Um, it, but NFTs can provide a, a medium for emerging artists and I think museums to monetize their artwork. There's deaccessioning within museums. Basically, there's an ethical issue in selling artwork, but they only show two to four percent of all their artwork. I think there are ways for them to monetize that by having, you know, digital exhibits or maybe able to structure or securitize something via the NFTs that helps them. Because admittedly, they've struggled over the last couple of years, and so, you know, as not many people are attending museums or galleries as, as in the past. So those those are our focus areas and where we see slight differentiation versus other alternative asset classes or even alternatives to the alternative asset classes. So one quick follow-up for Kelly, and I'll come to you, George. So are you dealing with just fungible tokens, or are you working with non-fungible as well? So talking about NFTs, it's an entire separate subject. So in our classification system, we do have a media entertainment, culture and entertainment category that covers art, 
And those tokens are actually mostly fungible because we don't really classify like a Beeple art or something because they are really derived in an art format. But when I think about blockchain technology, it can help arts investing in many different formats, right? So Sean, as you mentioned, tokenization itself could leverage the blockchain technology to really provide liquidity and tokenized version of the underlying asset. NFT is just another form. People think of NFT as JPEG, right? But they're not necessarily art, right? NFT being non-fungible token, I view it as a mechanism to pretty much tokenize anything that's non-fungible, right? Whether it's a piece of art, whether it's sports ticket. Whether it's whether data. It's like, yeah, exactly. So basically things that are different from each other. Um, so NFT itself, I mean, when I think about art, right? <laughs> I'm by no means an art major, right? And Sean, you know much more than me. But when you think about digital arts and when you think about the crypto punks of the world or the board apes, they are just a new different type of art format. So I think what's driving it, if you consider the bigger picture, right? People talk about metaverse. My kids play Roblox all the time. They live in the virtual world, right? If you think in the future, every one of us will have a virtual identity in the metaverse, then I can actually have a tangible way of hand my art in my virtual house. So in that way, like, oh, if like one of the, the big incentive for a rich person to own art is you can show it, right? And in your virtual house, in the metaverse, you can also display your art. So I think in, in, in the future, in the digital economy, people will view different things in the digital format. And that's where I see maybe the mass adoption will come. Yep. Jordan, did you have a point? Yes. Um, so in, when I think of NFTs, I, I think, um, first of all, I'm excited about the long term of NFTs, but just the, the current you know, market in the short term, it's tough because there's not a lot of regulatory clarity. Um, but what I'm most excited about is bringing liquidity to previously illiquid or opaque markets. Obviously, art is an example of that, but there are different types of art. There's digital art and there's physical art. Now, I think it's, it lends itself much more easily to digital art um, and you know, much less easily to, to physical art. Um, and, and so it, another example of that is, is uh, data. Data is an intangible asset that people don't really know how to value. They don't know how to price it. They don't know how to, where to exchange it. It's even if you know, it, it, there's a long uh, onboarding and, and, and process to, to, to retrieve the data and buy the data. Well, what if you were able to easily do that on a public record, public led ledger, um, and the pricing was automatically discovered by the, the marketplace or by the, the users of your protocol? And that's kind of what we're doing at BDP, at Big Data Protocol. We've created a um, alternative data uh, uh, blockchain-driven um, data marketplace where you can, uh, we, we create liquidity pools for each data set. So not only the, 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 the data provider itself, but the data set that each of their data products can be put onto our marketplace. People can actually stake their money or their BDP and say, hey, I think, even though I only have 100 bucks and I can't afford this data set, I think that this data set is super valuable and it will be much more valuable in the future. And so I can speculate on that data set. And in that way, people can actually automatically discover through a liquidity pool what the price of the data set should be, at least at that point in time, um, based on the future value of the data set, not just the current value of the data set. And so that allows users and, and, and data providers to uh, you know, basically uh, start selling their, or their data and making it liquid immediately. Thanks, Jordan. So I think we just have uh, a minute and a half left. So just maybe quickly starting with you, Greg, just uh, uh, closing observations uh, for the panel and for the audience. Well, I, I <clears throat> sort of touching on um, Sean's point, I, one of the things that we have found interesting uh, to think about is, you know, the, the growing um, income inequality and in, in the, in the, in the winners at the top, which in try and find areas uh, for our tribe doesn't fall into that, that category on an individual member level. But how do you, how do you benefit from that? Art certainly a, a possibility, you know, sports teams, uh, a possibility things where the rich people tend to tend to survive sort of no matter what. And uh, so we certainly look at that. And then we're just 
continuing to try and get smarter about alternative data. We're trying to get, continue to, to get smarter about understanding ways when, in which digital assets can be a part of our portfolio um, and add, hopefully, increased uh, overall returns with, uh, without increased risk, even if there's more risk, perhaps, at the individual uh, investment level. So that's what, that's what we're attempting to do. Great. Thanks, Greg. Jordan, closing uh, thoughts? One of the closing notes I'd like to leave with you guys is that if you are thinking about diversifying into new asset classes or uh, into new different types of uh, asset managers, um, alternative data can be a driver for all of that. It could, you can find alpha in any asset class using alternative data um, and, and by using new, new data analysis processes. And really what you should be thinking about is how do I integrate that, that, that into my investment process? Even if I don't you know, have a data science scientist on board, um, can I use tools that are already, you know, kind of readily available to me um, that have those uh, visualizations in, in place where I don't have to do my own analysis? There's a whole wide range of over, we've, we've identified over 20,000 data providers that are out there. So it, your imagination can run wild. Terrific. Kelly? Just to echo the title of the panel, innovation in asset management never stops, right? And this is a good time where if you just think about crypto asset, crypto digital asset as a separate asset class, we now have accumulated data. So we can really backtest this market. And I would say like the stress test is actually still going on. I would say for those of you who are interested in digital asset, definitely take a look at the data perspective and look at the history and also think of them as sort of different from each other in terms of their use case. And I think providing the benchmarks and providing this digital asset classification standard really help investors to take a seat back, right? Look at the data, look at the use case, and build your own models in terms of being able to compare apples and apples to the digital asset space. Thanks, Kelly. Sean, final word? Yeah, just real quick, uh, two data points that we think are interesting. Over the last few years, we've seen a migration of uh, invest investment firms uh, focus on all three channels. So within that institutional investors, so endowments, foundations, pensions, wealth managers, and then individual direct to consumer. Uh, in the past, usually firms only focus on one. Now we're seeing them getting involved with two. In certain ways, we're involved with all three. But also I'd say Deloitte had an interesting study where 50% of wealth management institutional investors wanted collectibles and uh, or art, inclusive of art, digital assets, sports teams and the like. That's actually increased 85% over the last uh, seven years. And so we see that there's demand. And so enable to, to be able to facilitate strategies, solutions, data to help people get more comfortable to get exposed to these asset classes will help everyone. Terrific. We'll leave it at that. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you. Thank you.